Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to continue. Sorry for missing the last two days. Uh, I'm going to continue the Sahaba series for day, I think, number eight of Ramadan, inshallah. Uh, today we're going to about, talk about Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, radiallahu anhu, an Ansari man from Medina, uh, the leader of the Aus tribe, the biggest uh, sub tribe in Medina. Um, I'm just going to put a forewarning out there. This one is very political, so try to stay with me because you have to have somewhat of a background of the political climate at the time to understand Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad's importance. So I'll get into that, inshallah. Uh, Sa'ad was born in Medina in 590 CE. About, he's about 20 years younger than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Uh, he was the leader of the Aus tribe, like I said. Um, and you gotta understand Medina at the time before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the reason why they wanted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to uh, come to Medina was because they were having uh, multiple problems within themselves. And there was uh, a lot of dissent and civil uh, disputes going on. There was a lot of wars going on between the tribes within Medina. So the two main leaders of Medina, well, they're the most prominent leaders due to the fact that they had the most amount of people a part of this tribe. It is one big old tribe. There's a lot of sub-tribes within it. So this tribe was called Banu Abdul Ashhal, uh, which was consisted of the two main tribes of Banu Khazraj and Banu Aus, like I mentioned. Um, Banu Khazraj was the bigger one. And the leader and the maternal cousin of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad uh, of the Banu Khazraj tribe was Ashad ibn Zurara radiallahu anhu. And he was the first convert to Islam in Medina. So they came to Mecca on business and they heard the Prophet Sallallahu teaching and it kind of aligned with their uh, Jewish slash, well, there was pagans within Medina, but it was a much more Jewish uh, centric uh, center. Um, and Medina was a very, very important, this was like the worst case scenario for the uh, polytheistic Meccans due to the fact that they needed Medina. So in order to attack the Muslims who were now going to Medina, who were being welcomed by the leaders of Medina, uh, they would be attacking their own economy. So this was like the worst case scenario. And Sa'ad ibn Murad, he had a, a lot of connections within Mecca, even with the polytheistic Meccans, to a point that um, Sa'ad ibn Murad is the, one of the only Muslims that was allowed to come freely to and from Mecca to Medina, even during the time period when Muslims could not return to Mecca. Uh, and this is narrated by Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who we'll do an episode on sh uh, soon enough. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad actually told him this story. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was an intimate friend of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, the, the, the former owner of Bilal that we talked about in the uh, last episode, also was an enemy of Islam. Um, so when Umayyah would come to Medina, he would stay at Sa'ad's house, and Sa'ad would stay at... Uh, Umayyah's house whenever he visited Mecca. So they, they had a very close friendship. Um, so when he arrived at uh, Medina, I mean, I'm sorry, when Sa'ad came to visit Mecca after the Prophet had migrated to Medina, uh, he said to Umayyah, tell me of a time when the mosque, meaning the Kaaba, the mosque is empty so that I may be able to perform tawaf, to walk around the Kaaba. Uh, and so Umayyah went to, went with him about midday, about Asr time, and, uh, he allowed him to perform his tawaf. But in the middle of this, Abu Jahl saw them and, uh, approached them and said, Oh, Abu Safwan, referring to Umayyah, Umayyah, who is this man accompanying you? He said, he is Sa'ad, uh, he is Sa'ad. Abu Jahl addresses Sa'ad saying, I see you wandering about... I see you wandering about safely in Mecca, in spite of the fact that you have given shelter to the people who have changed their religion, i.e. became Muslims, and have claimed that you will help them and support them. By Allah, if you were not in the company of Abu Safwan, you would not be able to go to your family safely. He's basically saying, you're lucky this man is here right now to protect you, because I would be handling you different. So he's basically threatening Saad. And uh, Saad uh, raised his voice at him. And said, by Allah, if you should stop me from doing this, i.e. like performing tawaf and being around the Kaaba, I would certainly prevent you from something which is more valuable for you. That is your passage through Medina. Like I said, Medina is a very important center, uh, trade route for uh, Mecca. A lot of their economy is tied up within Medina. So this is like the worst case scenario for the Mecca uh, at the time that the Muslims found refuge in Medina. Um... And Umayyah said to him, 
Oh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Umeya said to him, Umeya had to take his own tribesmen's. Uh, this was the end of Saad and Umeya's uh, friendship, uh, according to sources. So Umeya said to him, Oh, Saad, do not raise your voice before Abu al-Hakam, which means uh, father of the wise, uh, which was Abu Jahl's name before Islam, uh, the chief of the people of the Valley of Mecca. Sa'ad said, O oh, Umayya, stop that. By Allah, I have heard Allah's messenger predicting that the Muslims will kill you. Umayya asked, in Mecca? Sa'ad said, I do not know. And Umayya was deeply devastated by this. He never knew the Prophet said him as a liar, so he really took his words to heart. And he was really shook by this. And when Umayya returned home, he said to his wife, O oh, Um Safwan, don't you know what Sa'ad told me? She said, what has he told you? He replied, he claims that Muhammad has informed him that they will kill me. I asked him in Mecca, and he replied, I do not know. Then Umayyah added, by Allah, I will never leave Mecca. But when the Battle of Badr came, um, and just a heads up, I'm going to be going a little bit all over the place, because uh, I have to explain, like, context is needed. So I will be talking about different figures, and I will get back to Sa'ad, radiallahu anhu, eventually. So when the Battle of Badr came... Um, Umayyah was still hesitant to leave Mecca because of the words of the Prophet Sallallahu He didn't want to really leave. But Abu Jahl came to him and said, Abu Safwan, if people see you staying behind, though you are the chief of the people of the valley, then they will remain behind with you. He's saying, listen, you have political pool, and I need you to be with us. So what was happening during the Battle of Badr was uh, Abu Sufyan uh, would go twice a year, another prominent Meccan leader of the Banu Umayyah clan. He would... Uh, go twice a year into the Levant in Syria and bring back merchandise. And all these prominent Meccan uh, leaders had merchandise and uh, money tied in with these uh, caravans coming in from Syria to Mecca, um, into Mecca. Um, so what the Prophet said and the uh, people of Medina were planning on doing was raiding one of these uh, caravans and bringing back the plunders and the wealth back to Medina as a... Uh, a revenge for uh, all the years of persecution and the blackballing and the uh, torture that they put them through in Mecca. So it was an act of war, in a sense. Um, so they needed uh, ev everything they can, and they collected a few people who uh, had the pull to, uh, I guess, uh, garner enough power. So the Muslims came into this thinking it was a raid. They were not prepared for battle. Uh, but uh, so after uh, they found out the the caravan uh okay abu sufyan caught on to this by uh he was at a spot and he saw a camel dung so camel excrements and he saw the dates that were he was already suspicious because people were asking him questions he saw the dates and uh the dates of medina i think ajwa dates if i'm not wrong uh, have very specific kinds of kernels the little seeds inside so he was able to detect from that that somebody from medina was there uh and he got a weird feeling and he went on a different route he changed the route so the muslims no longer were able to raid this uh, caravan because he completely changed the route so after the caravan had traveled traveled a safe distance distance from badr abu sufyan and another messenger uh sent another messenger to the relief uh column however unbeknownst to him the two parties had already passed each other via different routes when the messenger delivered the message the column was already within three miles of badr and had sent some of the men to fetch water from the well of badr Learning of the caravan's safe escape, the column was faced with internal divisions. Some chose to return home. So, okay, let me sum that up. So there was starting to begin division. Now, a lot of people were going there with the intention to protect the caravan. But Abu Jahl, <coughs> excuse me, Abu Jahl wanted to exterminate the Muslims once and for all. He really wanted to take care of this problem that they were having and just eliminate it because the Muslims were only about 300 in number, 313 according to narrations. And, uh, a lot of the parties did not want to uh, go out and full out war with the Muslims because they didn't really have a personal vendetta like the a lot of the people, uh, the prominent men in Mecca did. Uh, uh, so part of the people that left were uh, the uh, the party of Banu Zuhra, a clan uh, that I mentioned in the Abdurrahman ibn Auf episode, who the Prophet's mother and Abdurrahman ibn Auf were a part of. They did they left. They did not participate in the Battle of Badr. Uh, a group of polytheists from the Banu Hashim clan, the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu himself, uh, led by Talib, the eldest son of Abu Talib, uh, Muhammad's old uncle, uh, who had just died and uh, used to protect the Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca, 
And third, Bani Adi ibn Ka'ab clan, the the relatives of Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, their clan also did not part uh, participate. And this was about a thousand men uh, going to protect their caravan. But after these groups left, it's estimated that about 600 to 700 men were there. Uh, and you got to think, uh, the, the Muslims were in a very weird spot. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want to, like, put the Ansar through this Meccan political, you know, dispute that they were having. So he was very hesitant in the way he wanted to approach this. So, um... He turns uh, and looks, and he says, advise me, O Muslims. But indirectly, he was talking to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, who being the leader of the Ansar, uh, leader of the majority of the Ansar. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, who said, it looks you mean us, Ya Rasulullah, by he who has sent you with the truth. If you seek to cross the sea and go in it, we will follow you, and none among us will re remain behind. We will not hate for you to lead us into battle against the enemy tomorrow. We are patient in war, vicious in battle. May Allah allow you to witness from our efforts what comforts your eyes. Therefore, march forward with the blessings of Allah. He basically gives him the okay. And this, this shows the political genius of the Prophet Wasallam. And we're going to touch on that in this episode once we get to the battle of Khandaq as well. But diplomatically, the Prophet Wasallam was so gifted. And I feel like that's what really helped spread his message. Because you need to be in this climate, this Arab climate. This pre-Islamic climate, you need to be politically savvy. You have to understand how to delegate. You have to understand how to be diplomatic at times. And you have to know when to use force at the right time. And he knew, had he just forced the Ansar without their permission into this battle, it would have been detrimental to A, them and the people of Medina. And it would have disrupted the whole uh, society they had going there. Uh, the Muslims, out though, although being outnumbered to like one to three, uh, had been there before the Meccans by an extra few days, and they were able to strategically uh, position themselves on the land they stood on, with the mountains to their back, and uh, they filled all but one of the uh, wells of Badr. Badr was known for their wells. It was a stop along a route for um, people coming in with caravans. So um, they filled every one of the wells except for the one that the Muslims were surrounding with rocks and sand. So think about this. The Muslims stood on the only dry land in the area, leaving the Meccans, Meccans without water, and they were stuck in swamp-filled marshy land. So the water, I mean, this land they were standing on was very muddy, and it was very hard for horses, camels, or whatever cavalry you had to move around. Not only were they dehydrated, and it was hot in the middle of the summer, um, they were left with very little mobility to really move around. And the army being out, outranked or outnumbered, Back in the day, what they would do with number, uh, armies that were outnumbered like that, they would flank them. So what they would do is they'd go around back and they'd surround them and basically come together and smash and destroy the army that is smaller. But since there's a mountain to their back, they can't do that. And they can't also uh, use, uh, take the animals and put them through such a thing like putting a large number of them over the mountain, down onto the mountain, and attacking them. from. They'd be exhausted by the time they even got to the back of the Muslims. So it was a very strategic, genius plan by the Muslims. Excuse me. Uh, fast forward to the Battle of the Trench in 627 CE. Uh, the Meccans were uh, unsuccessful in besieging the Muslims. What they did is they, they wanted to, once and for all, wipe out the Muslims. And a siege wasn't in in the books for them but with the muslims with the help of salman ibn Far uh, salman al-farsi i'm sorry uh came up the idea of building a trench around medina because the medinan landscape from behind was covered in trees and mountains like i said they can't be flanked so what do the meccans do in order to do this they they surround they pick a bunch of tribesmen uh tribes around the area who were anti-muslim and some of them had actually gone into agreements with the prophet sallallahu alaihi himself and uh they went back on their agreement to attack them and take over Medina. Like I said, this is a prominent political, economic place for everybody involved. So they wanted to just handle this once and for all. But what they needed was they needed a group that was within Mecca, I mean, within Medina, to take care of it for them in case they can't flank. So what they needed was internal uh, warfare as well within the city of Medina while they are attacking. So it would be absolute chaos for the Muslims. They're being attacked within the city. They're being attacked from outside the city. They would be done, basically. You know, they'd be slaughtered. 
so they came to the Banu Qurayza uh, tribe who uh, were not happy with the Prophet Sallallahu presence there. There were the Jewish tribes. There's a few Jewish tribes who were very against the Prophet Sallallahu coming to Medina. Uh, Banu Qurayza uh, were reluctant at first, but being assured by Abu Sufyan and the rest of the Meccans and the other tribes surrounding them that uh, this would be the last of the Muslims. This would be it. Like, we're not going to have to deal with them again. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, another part of his political genius, they 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 um, built the trench around it, and the, the Meccans are right outside the city for 27 days. It took six days to build the trench, and the 21 days that they were outside of the city waiting for the Muslims to run out of resources. But what they didn't account for was the horrible weather, the division amongst themselves, once things got complicated, and uh, basically they were running out of pro uh, resources themselves. They didn't expect it to take as long as it did. So it was getting very difficult, and a lot of the cavalry, like the horses and camels, were starving to death or freezing to death because the nights were very, very cold. This was January, you know, this is January 627. So it was early on in the, uh, basically in the year. So it's very cold at night. Um, so a lot of the Jews of Banu Qureza started uh, secretly approaching Sa'ad and other Jewish, old old people who were Jewish, were like, oh, do you not miss how Yathrib was? And they said Yathrib, not Medina, because when the Prophet Sallallahu came to Medina, he renamed Yathrib to Medina. So originally it was Yathrib, so the old Jewish tribes would still name it Yathrib when talking about it. Like, do you not miss Yathrib the way it was before all this, before all this warfare and this political, you know, in instability and, um, Word got back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi but he kind of played dumb with it, acting like he didn't know that there was something within them. Um, so once uh, there was a miscommunication amongst the Banu Qurayza with the outside tribes by, uh, I forgot the man's name. It was a Sahabi who secretly became Muslim who was amongst their ranks. Uh, he... he assisted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in creating miscommunication between the outside tribes and the Banu Qurayza. He would tell the Banu Qurayza, listen, if this goes left, the Meccans said they're not going to protect you. So if this goes left, you guys are all going to die and you guys have no protection from the outside sources that are claiming to help you. Then they'd go out to uh, the Me uh, Meccan side and would tell them that Banu Qurayza went over to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's side. So they're on the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like the diplomatic genius, I cannot urge you enough how diplomatically smart and savvy the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam really was because he knew within this division they'd implode. And due to this, they uh, the Meccans would retreat and Banu Qurayza was held siege within the city in their own neighborhood that they stayed in. The Muslims held them siege and they eventually uh, would give in. And they also, in, in this attack, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was attacked by a few members of Banu Qurayza. And here's a description of his injuries. Let me read that out for you. Um, it says, in one of the rounds of war, Sa'ad's arm was showered with mows of one of the disbelievers. Uh... Mose of one of the disbelievers. So I guess he was he was cut with a sword. Blood gushed severely from his wounds. He received first aid assistance to stop the bleeding. Then the Prophet Sallallahu ordered him to be carried to the mosque where the tent was put up so that he could be near the Prophet while he nursed. Uh, the Muslims carried him into the Prophet's mosque and Saad looked up in the sky and said, O oh Allah, our Lord, if the war against the Quraysh is to last any longer, please do not let me live a little while I mean please let me live a little while longer to fight against them for I like nothing better to fighting those people who hurt your prophet disbelieved him and even drove him to emigrate but if the war has already ended please make my wounds pave my way um, please make my wounds pave my way to martyrdom I implore you dear Allah do not let me die until I avenge myself uh, upon uh, uh, Banu Qurayza so he's swearing to Allah he's making dua to Allah to allow him to survive to uh, exact his revenge on Banu Qurayza. And Banu Qurayza eventually gives up. They eventually uh, say, okay, we give up. They gave up the siege. They surrendered to the Muslims. Um, and what they did is they implored the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to allow Sa'ad, the one person who had been severely uh, injured by them, to come up with uh, their punishment. And Sa'ad was very well versed in the Old Testament and Jewish law. And he used, uh, it is said, he used the verses uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, 12 through 14. 
And the verse goes, uh, starting from verse 12 to 14, if they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it in your hand, put this put to the sword all the men, men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunders for yourselves. So he used these uh, verses. It's narrated he used these verses as a way to exact the punishment. So Benu Qurayza's uh, men who were in the army that they, that was planning to fight uh, were murdered and their children and uh, war, I mean, wealth were basically delegated amongst the Muslims. Um, and shortly after this, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad had passed away. He died as a result from his wounds a month later. And the Prophet Sallallahu has said to, said to his companions that, sorry, let me find, I don't want to misquote this important part. So Sa'ad's wounds became ev uh, worse every day. Uh, one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi visited Sa'ad and found him on the verge of death. So he put his head on his blessed lap and called upon Allah. O oh Allah, our Lord, Sa'ad has striven hard, hard in the way of Allah. He believed in your Prophet and did his very best. So please do accept his soul with good full ex uh, acceptance. The words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt like coolness and safety on the departing noble soul. He strove to open his eyes, hoping that the last face he would see was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's. Peace be upon you, Prophet. I do witness that you are indeed mes the messenger of Allah. So these are Saad's uh, last words according to uh, according to the narrations. The Prophet ﷺ took a farewell look at Saad's face and said, Rejoice, Abu Amr. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I was one of those who dug Saad's grave. And each time we dug out the layer of sand, we smelled musk. This went on until we reached his burial niche. Saad's death was a tragic loss for the Muslims. Um... Uh, so the Prophet said, the throne of Allah, the, the throne of Ar-Rahman shook when Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad died. So that Allah's throne shook. And you got to understand, you, you can take this figuratively, literally, whatever. But the, purport, the point is, this is how important this man was to the Muslim cause. The throne of Allah shook when he died. That's how important he was. And I want you to understand uh, the battle of Khandaq. Had it gone the Meccans way... The Muslims, A, me and you probably wouldn't be Muslim. And this was it. This was like there. The Meccans were overtaken within two to three years within this. Because their trade routes were, they were done economically now. Uh, so many of the tribes had turned their back on the Meccans because they were the weaker force now. Despite outnumbering the Muslims. Economically, politically, in every way you can think of, they were outmatched by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, um... It was only a matter of time before the Muslims would be able to regain Mecca, which was within two to three years of this at this point. So you got to think like this point, this battle, the battle of the trench is so is deemed so important for this reason. Like this was the turning point for the direction that Arabia at the time was going in. So without the sacrifice of Saad ibn Mu'ad and, uh, you know, the effort he put into uh protecting the Muslims, bringing in the Muslims into Medina, uh, using his political clout to help the Muslims, uh, we would not more than likely have an Islam today to talk about or a deen to live by. So we are all indebted to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, and he's one of the more uh, more interesting Sahabis. There's so much more about him, but that, that's the main points because I have to fit this in within 20 minutes. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys. I'm sorry if I stuttered a lot. I'm having a little bit of throat issues because I talk every day um, at the mosque as well. So Jazakallah khair. Thank you for watching. Peace.